was There is a part of America whose very name symbolizes nature's power and plenty. Alaska, a land of amazing scenery and spectacular wildlife. Known as the last frontier, Alaska lies between two great bodies of water, the Arctic Ocean and the mighty Pacific. The sea around Alaska feeds one of the greatest gatherings of marine life in the world. Humpback whales and Stella's sea lions feast on vast shoals of herring. And for centuries, these beautiful seas have also fed Alaska's coastal communities. Today, the fortunes of the abundant wildlife and people are even more closely entwined because a sinister force is killing the animals and everybody's desperate to find out what it is. Stella's sea lions, the toughest and largest sea lions in the world, are facing extinction. Sea otters and harbor seals have also suffered dramatic declines. There's a killer on the loose, somewhere. And even killer whales are in trouble. So many animals are disappearing that it's a national disaster. But who's to blame? Fishermen are prime suspects and the future for thousands of them and their families is in jeopardy. But are they guilty? Scientists are determined to find some answers, and the search for a killer is proving to be one of the greatest biological mysteries of our time. This landscape is inspiring for everyone who comes here. And few appreciate Alaska as much as Shane Moore and his family. We've been really lucky to see a lot of this state while making wildlife films. We wanted to find out what was going wrong. So we bought an old boat. My wife Libby and I take every opportunity to show Jesse and Mackenzie the wildlife and hidden places along this rugged coast. Libby and I have been coming to Alaska for 15 years now. And we love Alaska for its wildness. Here you've got peaks that stretch up 10,000 feet and glaciers that fall into an ocean that's just full of life. So when we learned from some biologist friends that stellar sea lions and other wildlife are vanishing here, we found it really disturbing. How could that be in this place, which we consider to be one of the last great wildlife strongholds in the world? What could be happening here? And I'm really pleased that we now have the opportunity to try and find some answers. 
Shane's job as a cameraman and diver gives him the chance to do his own detective work into Alaska's disappearing sea lions. As a biologist, he's able to pull together the many strands of scientific evidence that may explain the disaster, and diving will put him in the thick of the action. It's a personal mission. I feel really fortunate that my job allows me to experience some things that few people are lucky enough to see. Not only do I get to come to a place like Alaska, I get to go underwater and see animals like stellar sea lions in their element. It is indeed a privileged view. They're so amazingly graceful, friendly, and curious. They're a big predator with the big teeth. They could tear me limb from limb if they wanted to. But they don't. They just nip on me. These young animals love to investigate new objects with their mouths. They don't have any hands. That's just their way of touching. So as one of the few people that's come to see them in their world, I feel an obligation to try to tell their story. So far, we know very little about what goes on down here. But scientists have a pretty good understanding of the sea lion's life on land. Sea lions breed on rocky islands, and females give birth to just one pup in spring. They're born into a rough and rowdy world, and this is about as gentle as it gets for a sea lion pup. And recently, things have got worse. Most of these pups will be dead within a couple of years. The big question is why? By looking at these rookeries year after year, scientists have charted the dramatic collapse of the sea lion population. And Shane's quest leads him to a man who's been studying sea lions for 30 years, Ken Pitcher. No okay, sounds great. Ken, where have the animals declined? In Alaska, the decline has occurred from Prince William Sound through the Gulf of Alaska and then out through the uh, Aleutian Islands. Just to get a little idea of the magnitude of the decline, it's really quite striking. This was taken in the 1970s. This is another photo of the same rookery taken during the 1980s and then during the 1990s. And as you can see, the, the difference is quite striking there. I was horrified to learn from Ken that sea lions have declined by an amazing 80%, and they're vanishing without a trace. It's so rare to see a dead sea lion that I'm really surprised to find this one, and that's part of the mystery. There's lots of death, but no bodies. If all the dead animals were washed upon the beaches, there would be international outrage. But no bodies means no news, and no news means the world has virtually no idea of the tragedy unfolding here. But who or what is killing them? There's a long list of potential killers and many questions to answer. Could other animals, like whales, be beating sea lions in the race for food? Or have killer whales begun to kill and eat them? Have we polluted the ocean and broken the food chain? or are sea lions simply tangled up in our incessant need to take fish from the ocean? Are fishermen guilty? Or is nature itself responsible? Are sea lions starving as a result of natural changes in the ocean that affect the fish they eat? Maybe there's more than one killer. So which of these suspects are guilty? Nothing in nature is simple, and the mystery of the disappearing sea lions in Alaska is no exception. But why are they dying? Many people suspect that they're starving to death. Sea lions are fish eaters. Their main prey includes herring, salmon, and pollock. But since pollock appears more often on the sea lion's menu, people were bound to make connections between pollock and sea lion declines. 
In the 1970s, the Alaskan pollock industry expanded into the largest fishery in the world, just as sea lions began to disappear. It seemed the pollock fishermen had been caught holding a smoking gun. Blaming the fishermen was easy, and when environmental groups took them to court recently, Stella's sea lions finally made the news. Big time. The world's largest sea lion at the center of a controversy that could cost the world's largest fishery dearly. In a teleconference today... The federal court judges had made a shocking decision. A total ban on pollock, cod and atka mackerel fishing in two-thirds of the sea lion's critical habitat. A huge area. It was a victory for the environmental group, Greenpeace, who had taken out a lawsuit to stop the industrial fishing, claiming it was killing sea lions. But it was a devastating blow for Alaska's fishermen and their families, who claimed they were being prevented from earning a living on the flimsiest of evidence. Competitive sectors of the fishing industry. They were angry and afraid. Plea for help. There isn't a fishing family today, west of Kodiak, that isn't in fear of their own financial livelihood. Really, we've been told that this is, this is what's going to happen with little or no public input on science that is speculative at best and wrong at worst. Do the fishermen have a point? They've certainly been shut down, but they think they've been made scapegoats and claim that there are now more pollock than ever before. They also claim that sea lions are being killed by another suspect, killer whales. Sea lions and killer whales have coexisted for millennia, but have killer whales started slaughtering sea lions? Shane joined Pollock fisherman Jay Stinson and asked if anyone had witnessed killer whales attacking sea lions. Oh, you bet. There's uh, footage of these transient killer whales operating right inside the harbor. Fishermen have to be good observers to do their job, and their video recordings are proof that killer whales eat sea lions. These seem to be thrashing the sea lion to death with their tails. He's still there. In another part of Alaska, scientists found a killer whale with the remains of at least 13 sea lions in its stomach. Killer whales have been observed killing sea lions all over Alaska. But scientists aren't sure what role these deaths played in the declines. However, they do suspect that killer whales could now be keeping depleted sea lion populations down to low levels. Guilty or not guilty, killer whales and pollock fishermen are being blamed for sea lion declines. But Shane had a hunch the story could not be that simple and that there must be other causes for the sea lion's sad demise. Though sea lions have declined dramatically in the west of Alaska, scientists told Shane that only a thousand miles to the east, sea lions are actually increasing. So he went over there to investigate. Southeast Alaska is just such a beautiful place. Snow-capped mountains and glaciers plunging into deep fjords. I always love watching sea lions, and it's, it's great to see the haul-outs crowded with animals over here. They're really amusing. I think if there were only a dozen sea lions left in the world, they'd still be laying in a pile somewhere and complaining that there's not enough room. Sea lions are doing well here, but why? It seemed that to answer this question, I'd have to go back to basics and learn how this ocean system works. It's all to do with the collision of the sun and nutrient-rich waters. We think of the ocean as being pretty static, but actually it's in constant motion, particularly here in southeast Alaska, where the mighty Pacific Ocean collides with a mountainous landscape. Deep fjords magnify the currents into raging torrents, which makes filming underwater a bit of a challenge. 
But it's these currents that are the source of Alaska's richness, because currents drive the nutrient-rich water up into the sunlight, creating phenomenal plankton blooms, feeding great swarms of krill and copepods. It's bizarre swimming in this living soup, but these swarms form the first link in the food chain, and these tiny creatures feed one of the largest creatures, humpback whales. The fact that 30-ton whales can survive on these tiny crustaceans is evidence of their phenomenal abundance. But what do plankton and whales have to do with sea lion declines? The answer is surprising. Commercial whaling exploded in Alaska in the late 1800s, and at least 40,000 whales were killed. The killing only stopped 30 years ago, by which time 90% of the whales in these waters had been slaughtered. Fortunately, some survived. But scientists calculated that removing such a huge number of krill-crunching whales was likely to have upset nature's balance, leaving large quantities of uneaten plankton for other creatures, like fish. But killing whales didn't benefit all fish equally. Small fish like herring lost the race for plankton to a serious competitor, pollock. The pollock shoals increased while the herring declined, but how could this harm sea lions? You'd think more pollock would be good news for sea lions, but is it? A fascinating study at the Marine Science Center at Vancouver Aquarium is uncovering important clues. The studies have been carried out in the wild and in captivity, allowing Dr. Andrew Trites to learn more about Stella's sea lion diets, and his research team have trained several sea lions so they can measure food intake. I guess when we first started, there was a lot of controversy about what role did Pollock play in the decline of stellar sea lions. Some were saying that stellar sea lions were starving to death because they couldn't get enough Pollock to eat. Other people were saying, uh, the trouble is they eat too much of it. They're calling Pollock uh, the junk food of the sea. And what we've discovered is that stellar sea lions lose out three ways when they eat Pollock. Cody is one of nine <coughs> stellar sea lions. This teaches a lot about the nutritional value of different types of fish that they're eating in Alaska. We've learned, for example, that pollock costs an animal a lot more to digest. They get fewer calories from it, and the bigger fish, such as pollock, are much harder to digest than the smaller fish, such as herring. So for a stellar sea lion to get by on pollock, you would have to consume about 35 to 80% more pollock than herring, just to acquire the same number of calories. Well, the animals were eating herring, they were getting heavier each day. When the animals were switched onto Pollock, we saw them losing weight each day uh, until we stopped the experiment and put them back onto herring when they began to regain that weight. But certainly, if, you know, if you're gonna look at what is the staple food for Stella sea lions, I would say it's herring. That is their bread and butter. Andrew's research proved that sea lions thrive when they eat herring. So it seems that herring may be critical in solving the mystery of their declines. But herring are an important food for many creatures, and the competition is enormous. Could whales simply be beating sea lions to the dinner table? Well, if there's anything you need to know about whales and herring in southeast Alaska, 
there's only one man to ask, and that's Dr. Fred Sharp, who's made studying them his life's work. Fred's learned that while some whales eat krill, others specialize in herring, which they catch by surrounding the shoals with a net of bubbles. It's taken Fred more than a decade to understand their extraordinary hunting technique with the aid of sonar and underwater microphones. Oh yeah, they're singing nice and loud now. How deep are they going? Typically about 40 meters, 40, 50 meters. The herring schools average about 30 to 35 meters and the whales like to get underneath them. That's when they start making these incredible cacophony of sounds. Those sounds are used to ball the fish up and frighten them towards the surface. Now one of their buddies, he kind of heads the fish off at the pass. He goes up shallow, usually around 15 meters, and employs this circular curtain of air. Past the kelp there. Yeah. She's starting to hook around there. there. Yeah. I would say we've got about 10 seconds before they come out. Yeah, out yeah, that was a nice, it looks like a thousand dollars in silver coins being thrown out the pavement. Amazing, they'll do this all day. I mean, they'll do this for like eight, 10, 14 hours a day without a break. Someone has a furnace down there for processing that herring. How much herring do you think they're taking in a day? Well, sort of the classical amount that you hear is half a ton to a ton a day. And boy, the way they're going at it, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they could do twice that. It's incredible. And they all come up in the same position. Pretty much, time. yeah, pretty much. If they're the same combination of whales, they'll usually come up in that same pattern. I mean, day after day after day. It's just like military precision. That's teamwork. That's amazing. Humpbacks are the most acrobatic of all whales. It's almost like performing. They thrash around and occasionally leap clear out of the water. Or breach, as scientists call it. There's lots of different reasons why whales breach. But in these social pods, they tend to breach when the feeding's over. When things are slowing down, sometimes they're getting frustrated. You'll see one or two whales come rocketing up into the air, and that's it. We think it's a social leader who says, snack bar's closed, party's over, get out of my face. Comeback quails were nearly exterminated here, but Fred and other scientists have learned that they're making a comeback because they've developed a way of recognizing and counting individuals. The underside of each humpback's tail is like a giant billboard. It has a unique pattern of pigmentation and scarring that allows us to identify individuals. And this is extremely useful for these type of long-term studies and that allows us to track individuals over literally years and decades. With whales eating all these herring, you'd wonder if there'd be any left for sea lions. So it's astonishing to learn that killing whales here has probably resulted in fewer herring. It's a complex theory, but here's how it works. When we killed most of the whales decades ago, pollock flourished because more plankton was available. But pollock also eat herring, 10 times more herring than whales. So it's amazing to think that a century of killing whales probably contributed to the sea lion declines. The lesson is that nature is incredibly complex and we can be very destructive. But there could be a force even more powerful than humans affecting sea lions, the weather. 
Decades of fish trawling surveys have revealed dramatic changes in the numbers of many species in Alaska. And these changes have been monitored by a scientist who's been sampling marine life for over 30 years, Dr. Paul Anderson. And his results are crucial to this mystery. When I started in the early 1970s, our shrimp catches were almost pure shrimp with uh, small amounts of forage fishes like capelin. Starting in 1970 through the 80 period, we saw an influx of some large predator fishes, such as seen here, the Pacific cod, into the near shore areas. And by the 1980s and through the present time, our catches are now dominated by large numbers of ground fish. And shrimp have declined to only just a token amount. Herring has also shown some rather significant declines. Uh, by 1986, uh, we were down to very small token amounts of herring in our survey trawl catches. The decline in herring is bad news for sea lions. And when Paul discovered that the dramatic changes in fish populations coincided with a four degree Celsius rise in water temperature, which is huge for the ocean, it looked like even the weather was partly to blame. Weather and currents throughout the North Pacific are driven by a low pressure system that normally circulates here. But recently, it's moved much closer to shore. And this is where it is today. Scientists believe this climate shift changes the ocean currents, moving more nutrients down the coast to southeast Alaska. More nutrients means more fish and more food for all the wildlife here, including Stella's sea lions. If scientists can find out why sea lions are thriving here, they might be saved throughout Alaska. But to get these answers, they'll have to catch some sea lions underwater. Sea lions are vanishing from most of the North Pacific, but they're thriving here in southeast Alaska. Have they simply swum here en masse because shifting ocean currents have created more food? This was one of the questions that scientist Ken Pitcher wanted to answer. But to get these answers, he has to catch them underwater. Shane joined them in the attempt. When scientists tried to catch sea lions on land, it had proved almost impossible. And when I suggested they try to catch them underwater, everyone thought that was a crazy idea. But I'd been diving with sea lions long enough to suspect that their curiosity might be their undoing. Everyone was worried about the possibility of injuring the sea lions, but fortunately, not a single animal has been hurt. The captured sea lions are weighed to check their condition, and they appear to be healthy. Disease hasn't been a problem, and DNA sampling proves these animals didn't come from somewhere else. So the missing sea lions haven't moved. They've really vanished. Ken hopes that monitoring every movement of these healthy young animals with satellite transmitters will help explain the mass deaths elsewhere. They're particularly interested in how far they swim and how deep they dive. Ken's team can now follow the movements of individual sea lions with astonishing accuracy. Okay, number two, a seven-month-old juvenile was caught on January of 2000 at Benjamin Island. Uh, remained at Benjamin Island from January through March. So that's where it went on his yeah. head? The, gr the green dots are 
our location solutions from the satellite. He didn't move very much, did he? Not very much in that. Most of the animals remained with their mother for about a year. But how deep did they dive? We're still working up the dive data at the moment. Sea lion number two, when it was nine months old, made it to about 122 meters deep. The results show that young sea lions usually stay near the surface. This is crucial because there may be an ocean full of fish, but if they're too deep to reach, the youngsters will starve, particularly in winter. But in summer, the fishing is easy. I love summer here because fish move into relatively shallow waters where I can dive with them. I occasionally see tiny cod and pollock, but rockfish, sand lance, and herring are common, and fish migrations are phenomenal. It sure is inspiring to swim with the fish. When I'm down here among the herring, I can't help but notice that sea lions are always around, and herring are always on their menu. I also see them going for a whole variety of fish, and that mixed diet seems to be crucial to their survival. And summer is good news for sea lions, since it marks the return of a fish that's central to that mixed diet, salmon. Sea lions love salmon, and salmon love herring. Salmon eat a lot of herring, and sea lions eat a lot of salmon. It seems everything in the ocean is connected. It's like an enormous, intricate web of life. And I'm worried that the disappearance of sea lions may be telling us that the web is unraveling. But salmon and herring are doing well here in southeast Alaska at the moment, so there must be some other clues. How do all these animals relate to one another? And how do we fit into the picture? Fortunately, as a result of the sea lion crisis, scientists are finding some answers. And some of their discoveries are surprising. It's always fascinating to slip beneath the waves and see how things change through the seasons. Salmon and herring are clearly vital to sea lions, but they're not always available. In autumn, the plankton blooms that feed all these fish die off, and the salmon move out to sea. In the past, scientists believed that in winter, herring and many other fish descended into the depths, out of range of sea lions. So it was thought that the most difficult time for sea lions was winter. And winter in Alaska is six months long. The belief that sea lions were starving in winter because they couldn't reach their food has recently been turned on its head. And these exciting new discoveries on what happens to sea lions in the dark could be one of the most important clues yet in the mystery of their disappearance. Gary Thomas and his colleague Dick Thorne have pioneered new technologies 
for counting and observing fish in winter, including advanced sonar and acoustic equipment and infrared video cameras that can film at night. We've been doing these surveys now for eight years, and doing the surveys on the, the herring were just delightful. Between October and April, you go out into these areas, and there's birds, and there's whales, and there's sea lions, and there's sharks, and it's just, it's just a naturalist park. Gary and Dick carried out surveys at night making precise measurements of fish populations and finding out exactly where the herring and pollock schools were situated. But they also made a discovery vital to Stella's sea lions. The herring migrated up to the surface at night, making them available for a midnight feast. When we added the infrared video systems to our nighttime surveys in 2000, it just showed us the whole picture this activity, this intense feeding, the herding and, and crashing in and, and thrashing of these herring balls at the surface was all a nighttime phenomenon. The gulls were diving down, picking up herring, the, the sea lions were herding the fish into balls which they would attack with incredible enthusiasm and come, sometimes coming completely out of the water with herring in the air and it was, it was quite a scene. In contrast, you know, if you looked at the pollock, you might have 10 times as much pollock, but the pollock is aggregating at depths of 150 to 250 meters deep. In fact, I can't really remember ever seeing a sea lion on a pollock survey. So the behavior of the herring coming up at night and being able to be herded by the, the predators like sea lions into very dense balls is probably very critical, not just for the sea lions, but for a lot of other predators that are, that are fish eaters. It's clear from this new research that herring are more important to Stella's sea lions than we could ever have imagined. And it may also explain why the oil spill created when the supertanker Exxon Valdez struck the rocks was so devastating to wildlife. The problem here was that there were concentrations of herring in March of 1989 when the oil spill occurred. These fish coming up to the surface every night would be chronically exposed to any oil that was in the surface film. The herring suffered a total loss of that year class in 1989 and subsequently have had problems with disease and, and declining population numbers and it's crashed. We have reports the population of stellar sea lions in Prince William Sound is the most rapidly declining population anywhere, um, going down as much as 20% per year for this last decade, simultaneously with the crash of the herring. And their crash uh, lead you to the hypothesis that, that herring may be very critical to the stellar sea lions and, and other wildlife. Herring are obviously vital to sea lions. But what's caused herring declines? Pollution, certainly, along with climate change and the removal of whales. But what else? Shane returned to southeast Alaska to investigate. Each spring, enormous shoals head inshore to spawn. Swimming among them was a lifetime's ambition fulfilled. This spectacle has been described as one of the greatest displays of abundance in the natural world. And it's a magical moment when the herring lay their eggs on the prolific weed beds. But these shoals of herring are pursued by man in a multi-million dollar harvest that could cost stellar sea lions dearly. It's the job of Alaska's Fish and Game Department to control the herring catch to protect the breeding stock of fish. Biologists do this by measuring the number of eggs in previous years and calculating how many fish this will yield for harvest when they've grown up. Some say it's a risky technique, but they back up this research with measurements of the shoals and aerial surveys of the spawn. All of this science is coordinated by regional biologist Bill Davidson, who flies daily surveys to monitor the milky white spawn. 
This provides an estimate of how many fish there are and how many can be caught without damaging the population. It's amazing to see the herring spawn transform these dark blue waters. And at the height of the season, the eggs cover about 50 miles of coast. For fishermen, it's a vital time. A large part of their annual income can be earned catching these herring. And there's a lot at stake for wildlife too. After a long winter, this is their time to refuel in this once a year feeding frenzy. It's pretty obvious when you watch this event that herring are vital to wildlife. We used to call this a food chain, but really it's much more like a web, and herring are certainly at the center of that web. It seems everything likes to eat them. With so many predators around, even the gulls have to be careful. Otherwise, they might become part of someone else's feast. And amazingly, the slow or careless do. One gull down the hatch. When the herring are ready for harvest, Bill Davidson summons the fleet to take part in a fishery that will earn seven million dollars in just one hour. This hour is split into four openings of only 15 minutes, and to further restrict the catch, fishermen are confined to a small area. There are 51 boats, and they have only 15 minutes to the nearest second to make their catch. It is very, competitive. I don't know, this looks awfully good, Randy, but it, was, it looked awfully good over there, too. What do you think about competition? It's awesome to see so much power and technology focused on a tiny silver fish. But is this fishery the final straw for sea lions? Many Alaskans feel that herring are so vital to wildlife that we shouldn't harvest them at all. This year, the catch in Sitka is 12,000 tons. And though it's only 20% of the estimated number of herring, this one hour's catch is more than 100 million fish. And that would feed a lot of Stella's sea lions. This fishery is well managed and seems to be sustainable, and there's a real effort to harvest the herring responsibly. But even here, we can't be certain it's not damaging wildlife. These herring are caught for the valuable eggs that the females carry and are sold to Japanese buyers for export back home. Their presence sounds a warning, because they too had a big herring fishery in Japan, but so overexploited the resource that their herring are now virtually extinct.
Many bays throughout Alaska are littered with the skeletons of abandoned processing plants. They serve as stark reminders that herring can be overfished. Many stocks have never recovered, and Shane feels this is crucial to our story. I went back to Paul Anderson's scientific records to plot out on a graph how changes in fish numbers might explain sea lion declines. During the past 20 years, pollock have increased enormously in the Gulf of Alaska, while herring have declined drastically. I knew herring were important to sea lions, but I didn't expect sea lion declines to parallel those of herring so closely. Both have decreased by about 90%. With the pollock increasing by 90%, this evidence makes me wonder if shutting down the pollock fishery throughout much of Alaska was justified. It's great that we care enough about wildlife to curtail the biggest fishery in the world, but was it the right decision? I can understand why the pollock fishermen were so upset. Well, it's kind of hard to explain how you, how you can feel when your future's been cut like that. I don't know, I think it was felt for my family if I'm going to be able to support them anymore. All the canneries are, are closed. It, it is pretty dismal, boy. Our, our future was gone. You know, it, it was really gone. So is there a conclusion to the question, what is killing Stella's sea lions? Some people still think the pollock fishery is guilty but it's difficult to ignore the fact that pollock are more abundant now than before the sea lion declines. It seems like the answer to this mystery is food. It's clear that there have been drastic changes in the numbers of fish that Stella's sea lions like to eat, particularly herring. Which changes are natural or man-made, we may never know. But since so many animals depend on herring, changes in their abundance are bound to have far-reaching effects. The oceans are the last places on Earth where people exploit wildlife on a massive scale. And we can't ignore the fact that humans have become major predators. This mystery has shown us that the fate of man and wildlife is inextricably linked. Both fishermen and sea lions are casualties here. Sometimes the future of man depends on the health of the environment, and not just in Alaska. This story is challenging us to answer a fundamental question. Can we take from the ocean without destroying it, achieve a new balance with nature? It's a question the whole world needs to answer before it's too late. Luckily, Alaska is still vibrant with life, one of the richest places on Earth. And we're just beginning to learn about its complexities. Fortunately, scientists are striving like never before to understand how this ocean works. We can all be thankful for their efforts. Some people can't imagine a world without music or art, but others, like me, can't imagine life without wild places like Alaska and wild creatures like stellar sea lions. It would be a real shame if it takes such a lovely animal's extinction to convince us how much we have to learn. If you'd like...